one. Thank you for the, the welcome basket. Uh, I'll, I'm, on behalf of Deb as well, Deb's not here. Deb's not feeling well. She feels worse by the fact that she's not here, uh, but she's not feeling well, and she just didn't feel like it needed to be, uh, be around a lot of people. So thank you for that. I want to remind you, there are prayer slips out in the foyer right through the door over there. We want to encourage you to use those. Write your prayer requests. We have them in advance. You can pray over them through the week, but also on Sundays. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit different because we're at the beginning of the year, and I know some of us have lost loved ones who did not make the turn into 2022 with us. And so this morning, I would like to spend just a minute in, in silent prayer for those who aren't with us today because they didn't make the turn into 2022, but also then to pray about this coming year, new chapters, new beginnings, a new future, the celebration of 220 years of this church that's still making history today. So if you would, would you bow with me in silent prayer? Father, as we gather here at the start of this year, we, we think of those in our family, our dear friends, who have not made the turn into this year with us. We thank you for all that they meant in our lives, what they'll still mean and what their memory will always mean to us. So, Father, as they worked in the church, as they worked to serve you, I pray that you would find us just as faithful. And so, Father, as we face the next year, as we make this turn and we look into what you are doing in this place, I pray that you would tell us, you would show us what you would have us be about, how you would have us impact this community and the lives around us. God, that everyone in this community, everyone in the surrounding counties would know you because we become an even brighter light in the community. God, this church has an amazing 220-year history, but I know you are not done and you want to use us to continue to still make history today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you got your snow boots ready. I left the house. They were saying one inch of snow was coming. And a minute ago, somebody pulled up and said, no, five to eight inches of snow is coming. Uh, I'm just glad it wasn't today. What a great start that would have been, right? Real quick story. Uh, first time I ever taught Sunday school in my life, uh, my buddy, Jay McFadden, said, hey, man, you need to teach the Sunday school class. I'm going to be out of town. And I was young and dumb, and I'm like, oh, sure, no problem. And so I get studied, and I mean, I studied, and I studied, and I studied. Woke up, we lived in Germany. Woke up that morning, it was like eight inches of snow on the ground. I thought, okay, God, I get it. You don't want me to teach Sunday school. That's not my thing. The second time he asked me, about two months later, no kidding, the exact same thing happened. I'm like, okay, God, I get it. Uh, but anyway, there was a question that was asked uh, at the end of September. And it was a great question when I mean, we're all here meeting and talking and asking questions. And the question was brought up about people who have kind of disconnected because of the whole pandemic stuff. And they're not really gotten reconnected. And I gave a short answer then. But I'm going to give you a really legitimate long answer uh, starting today over the next six weeks. So you can't miss any of the next six weeks, okay? Nobody gets sick. Nobody travels. You've got to stay here for the next six weeks. Because I believe if we can get this down, we will find a way to reconnect people and to connect those that have not been connected before. And this is a problem that churches all, of our, all over the nation are facing. And it's estimated that some 20 to 25% of people who used to attend in person will never come back. And that's kind of sad. It tells me one of two things. What was their commitment level? I'll let them figure it out. That's between them and the Holy Spirit. But are we not doing our job? Are we not doing our job making disciples who want to be around other disciples? You ever met that person you just wanted to be around? A couple of you, the rest have no friends. Wow. You just, you just that person, you just wanted to be with them. That's how Jesus was. People just wanted to be around him. 
And you know the word Christian means a small Christ. And there's a way that we move toward that goal. How many of you would agree, and, and I've been told this coming here, that Salem Baptist Church is probably one of, if not the healthiest church in the state of Virginia? Would you agree? Okay, up and down is yes, side to side is no. Okay. But are we thriving? You know there's a difference between being healthy and, and thriving. If the church is an organiz- organism, and it is, and not an organization, and it is not, then the church should be able to reproduce like a healthy organism. That is, the ability to thrive as a church should be measured by our ability to reproduce in new disciples and growing disciples. How many of you have ever had a small child in your life? Child, grandchild, a favorite niece? I used to, you know, moms are like, moms are funny. Moms, when they're little bitty babies, still in diapers, they complain about the diapers. They go, oh, I wish they would stay this way forever. I'm like, no, grow up and get out the house. You got to go. And my kids are watching right now, so they know I've, I've used that before. So, um, but if your child is healthy, what do they do? They grow, and they mature, and they become hopefully productive adults in society. Well, the church is the same way. We are an organism. Individual cells that create one body that should, if it is healthy, reproduce in such a way that we get bigger and stronger and healthier. We call that discipleship. How many of you are old school Southern Baptist? Charter member at Salem. Okay, think about that one for a second. See, back in the day growing up, Discipleship for us was going to training union. Can I get a witness? Yeah, uh-huh. Showing you age. Um, and if you were a kid, you went to RAs or GAs. Amen? Right? Yeah, that's what we were taught. That's what we did. And that was discipleship. And when you left the building, it was kind of over. I, you may have been taught differently, but when I was growing up, we really didn't, wasn't, weren't taught that this the thing, discipleship was about being a lifelong, every day, every week, round the clock student. How many of you liked school growing up? I did, loved lunch. <laughs> loved it, it was great. In fact, I hated, I hated going to school. I hated being a student, I really did. And in fact, we found ways every, every, almost every day that we would show up at school and then leave and go to the beach and spend the whole day at the beach. Wasn't my fault they put the school in the middle of Florida. And come out, find out I'm actually become a lifelong student. Always learning, always growing. Listen, you and I can never say, I know everything there is to know about God and the Bible and Jesus. I don't have to do that any more because if you're able to say that then apparently you haven't read the right bible we are supposed to be as followers of jesus disciples true lifelong students today i want to give you a little different perspective than what we had growing up i want to give you the 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 biblical perspective on what being a disciple is when you say I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. What is it you are actually saying? And the reason why this is so important, why we need to cover this, is this. If you put five Baptists in a room and you ask them for the definition of what a disciple is, you will get seven answers. And chances are they will form a committee. We've got to be on the same page. If we're going to do this thing together, we have to be on the same page. So if you would, turn your uh, Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Uh, someone asked me earlier uh, what translation or, or do I use the Bible. I have the New American Standard. Maybe a little different than what you're used to. Maybe a different than what you have. I, but I'll be reading from the New American Standard. In Mark chapter 8, we're going to read verses 34 through 38. Because 
Isn't it the simplest thing to do is to go ask the question, what is it Jesus said was a disciple? What does he say a disciple is? And we'll just follow that. We'll just do that. Isn't it great when it makes it that simple? God's good like that. So in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I think it's interesting. It says Jesus gathered the crowds with his disciples. The crowds. Oftentimes, those are the people we don't like. The people that are on the fringe. You know, the crowd. You think, well, we're the disciples. We're the ones that should be. But he calls them all. All of you, every one of you, come here. Gather around. He gathers them around to include even the the ones that were just interested onlookers, not just the disciples. And he knew, Jesus knew that Most of the crowd were there for one of two reasons. Number one, the crazy miracles that were happening. Right? That's what it was a great show, wasn't it? So I'm gonna follow him. This is a great show. Let's see what he does next. Some were following for the buffet. All the free food that was showing up. But he still, knowing that that's who they were, he he pulled them all in together. And he said, okay, guys, you need to listen, and you need to listen closely. And even in doing this, he knew that many of them would walk away. His words, if anyone would come after me, if anyone. Church, there is no person outside these walls that Jesus does not want to change their life. There's not one soul outside these doors that he doesn't want to meet and talk to and save. And if that's what he says, if anyone, then you and I must treat it the same way. There is no one outside of these doors that is without that you can't reach and share Jesus with. That person at work that just drives you absolutely, you know, you know the one I'm talking about, just drives you nuts, nuts at work. The one that always gets promoted ahead of you because they suck up. And they're like, I can't stand them. You ever wonder why they're that way? See, disciples see them as a need, not a hindrance. He says, deny yourself. No simple, no selfish interest. Don't count on earthly security. Earthly securities are going to be like the snow we may or may not get tomorrow. It'll come. And just as soon as it got here, as quick as it got here, it'll be gone. He says, deny yourself. It's not about denying our personality. It's not dying as a martyr unless that's required of you or to deny having anything. To deny our personal desires. It's like even with the church, we have ideas. We, I'd like the church to do blank, and I'd like the church to do blank. Again, put five Baptists in a room, you will get seven directions. It's saying, no, what does God want of us to what does God want of me? And the true disciple says no to self. And says yes to selfless service. It's saying and praying one of the most dangerous prayers you will ever pray in your life. Does anybody know? It's in the Bible. Does anybody know what the most dangerous prayer is in the Bible? If you know, raise your hand. I won't call on you. 
simple. Thy will be done. Because as a disciple, if you say it and mean it, you know what? God will take you up on it. And he says, take up that cross. Jesus here says, take up your cross. Now, not literally. This is figuratively. That is our life as a disciple. When he says, take up your cross, that means our life as a disciple is on public display. You ever see around Easter time and you see pictures from the Far East and you'll see sometimes these groups will take a cross and they'll, they'll carry a cross and they'll carry it for miles and miles and miles? You ever seen that? Yeah, that's not what he meant. He meant that your life, my life as a disciple, to take up our cross is to take up what he has taught and what he is teaching and that the whole world will see it as we take that walk. It's like this. If, if you have to put a cross on the back of your car, if you have to put a fish, a little a fish on the back of your car to let people know you're a Christian, go, go pull it off today. Well, I just got in trouble, Kareem. I think somebody's upset with me. Got real quiet all of a sudden. The way you drive, and I'm thinking to myself here because my wife's watching and I get home and she's going to be like, you need to go back and listen to that again. The way you interact, the way you celebrate Mondays with your 10,000 closest friends on 95. I don't, we shouldn't need a sticker to say I'm a believer. Our lives should be, as we carry the cross, should be the advertisement. But you know, both of those things are conscious choices conscious decisions when he's talking to the crowd he's got them all together and he's okay look here's what you're gonna have to do you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and in that moment in that moment they had to decide what am i going to do Henry Blackaby said it, and I know you guys have done it over the many years. Henry Blackaby said that what you do next says more about what you believe about God than what you say you believe about God. And so faced in this moment with deny yourself, take up your cross, you and I have to make a conscious decision. And what we do next will speak volumes. To be a disciple is this. We don't do discipleship. You know that? We don't do discipleship. We are disciples. Let me tell you, this is where Jesus lost a lot of people. In 35 and through 38, it's his explanation that, of, of the requirement. But the start of that is uh, an allegiance to him and not our own self. Denying self, taking up the cross. Verses 36 through 37, he asked really what's a rhetorical question. Jesus was great about this. Instead of giving you straight up answers, he would ask questions and make you wrestle with it. Kevin and I share a, an old friend who's not here anymore. And he used to do that to me all the time. I would call him. Kind of, Y'all know Bob. Have you ever heard the name Bob Dale? Bob Dale is a friend of mine. And he works for the Virginia Baptist um, Mission Board and the BJV. And I would call him with some complaint or I was whining about something. And the great thing about Bob, if I called him whining about the church, he would say, stop whining. It's life. Get over it. But I would call him. And when I had a legitimate concern, you know what he did? Ask me questions. He would never give me the answer. I even told him one day, I'm like, Bob, what are you doing? I'm like, I call. I call and I call. I call you all the time and I ask you all these questions, looking for answers, and all you do is ask me questions. He says, How'd that make you feel? But he was taking his cue from Jesus. How do you learn? How do you grow? So here he asked him the rhetorical question. He says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? What, there's no answer to that, it's, it, it, but it's there to make us think. What, what good is it if we gain everything here 
and knowing that as soon as we get it, it will dissipate as quickly as the snow. And you say, well, that's okay, but I've had this thing for 40, 50, 60, 100 years. That's right, but one day you won't. And the only thing left meaningful is a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ and how you have followed him with your life. Jesus in 38 says, if you deny me, there's going to come a day, a point in time, where I will stand before the Father and I will have to say, Dad, I, I, don't, I don't know her. I don't, I don't know him. You're like, but, but, but. He's like, I'm sorry. To be ashamed of Jesus is to reject him. To not follow him is to reject him. It's the same thing. You, you know this thing about, you know, no answer is still an answer. To not follow him is still an answer. And while you and I see this as a serious outcome, the world today does not see it that way. Couldn't give two flips. So let's talk about today then. Living this on an everyday basis. How many of you will spend the next seven days in this room never leaving? Nobody? You're going to leave here today. You're going to go to work tomorrow if it doesn't snow. You're going to run into people from various walks of life. If we take up our cross and follow him daily, you are walking into places that I will never go. You are walking into places that Shannon or Kareem will never go. You are walking in places that some of our deacons will never go. You may be the only Jesus they ever see. That's a scary proposition. But that's what our life is on a daily basis. Do you know that Jesus says some 78 times in the Gospels, follow me? Do you think he was trying to make a point? Follow me me this viral it, it's it's you and i as followers of jesus becoming viral famous you know enjoyable word for the past two years right can you imagine if the church behaved like covid how fast would the gospel of Jesus Christ spread? You see, that was Jesus' point. Change the world. You start with the person right next to you. You know what a viral video is, right? It's the one that somebody posts and does it, it seems kind of innocuous, and then it gets like a gazillion views on YouTube. Yeah, mine went. Vi I had a video go viral once. All seven people emailed me. It was great. Y'all know what the most viral video is in the world, has ever been in the world? I'm going to tell you, but you can't sing it. Promise me you won't sing it. Promise me. Okay, the single most viral video in the world ever in history is Baby Shark. <laughs> and nope, I am not going to sing it. <laughs> and later on, when you're sitting at lunch singing it to yourself, you can thank me. That's how we're supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to be in daily life, that it goes viral. I've got a buddy of mine, a chaplain with the U.S. Navy. I love him to death. I've known him for almost 20 years. And he goes out, and he's, right now he's stationed with Marines. God love him. And he goes out on maneuvers and stuff with the Marines. He goes and hangs out with them. He goes in the dining hall. And he goes to the workplace. He hangs out with them. He's not required to. But now he told me he has some of the strangest Marines coming asking him questions about God and Jesus. All because my buddy Jay took his cross and walked in the middle of them carrying rucksacks and running and doing PT. That's discipleship. 
It's a life commitment that becomes viral because it's our lifestyle. Does it mean uh, coming to worship? Does it mean going to a Sunday morning Bible study? Does it mean coming to Sunday or midweek Bible study in the evening? Does it mean reading and studying your Bible at home? It means all of that, but it's so much more. All of that is designed to make changes in your life on a daily basis. Are you going to be more a follower of Jesus in 2022 than you were in 2021? If you had a child that wasn't growing, what would you do? Please tell me you would take him to the doctor. It's an interesting word. There's an interesting word in, 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 the, in Hebrew for student or disciple. It's the word, it's talmidim. T-A-L-M-I-D-I-M, talmidim. It's not like a student like we think. It's entirely different. This is what would happen. If you wanted to study with a rabbi, you went to the rabbi. Hey, rabbi, can I study with you? And the rabbi would look at you up and down. He probably thought about how wealthy your family was or was not, what they had and what they did not have, and whether he thought you were smart enough or not. And he would say, no. Every now and then he would say, yes, you may. Do you understand the switch that's just happened here in this text? Jesus said, come follow me. The rabbi went to the student who before was told, you're not worthy. You're not worthy to follow me. And Jesus said, anybody can follow me. Anybody. And Talmudians would live with their teacher. They would sit at his feet and they would read and they would study and, and they would then go talk about it. They would actually then go off on their own and, and, and talk about it. They were given responsibilities. They were, they were told, okay, you're going to cook. You're gathering wood today. You're, pitch, you're setting up the tent. All those things. They would sit down and eat together and he would teach. Or the, t the, t the rabbi would teach them and then they would go later on and talk about it again. They would question him as they went through the life every single day when they went from place to place. They would say, Rabbi, what did you mean by that? And he would answer their question with a question. <laughs> well, what do you think it said? What did the rabbis say? What did the, what did they, what did the religious rites say? What, what, what did they say it is? They would spend so much time. How many of you have been married like a really long time? Really, really long time. I'll let you define that, okay? So y'all be careful. Um, you ever heard him say that, you know, married couples start to look like each other after, after a certain number of years? Y'all pray for my wife. Y'all, please pray for her. Um, that's, that was a Talmudum. A Talmudum would learn and study and listen and enact and, in, and, in, and use what he had learned or from, from, from the, the master, from the rabbi, from the teacher, in such a way that eventually they sounded like him. They walked like him. They talked like him. It was as if they had become an exact replica, a carbon copy of their rabbi. And that is the thing that Jesus calls us as disciples. Do, do we look more like our teacher today than we did Christmas morning? They would grow, and here's one of the great things. Then he would send them out. He said, you know what? You've learned a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. You know what? Here's what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the 70 of you guys, and I'm going to send you out. I'm going to stay here, but you guys are going to go out and tell them the kingdom of God is at hand. You think we're ready, boss? You were ready when you got here. You were ready once you met me. You were ready once you committed to follow me. Because you've made the personal investment. Listening and growing. You, you invested yourself. Everything became secondary when you made that choice. And then it led to spiritual growth. 
We have to be passionate in our devotion and investment to him and to his example. Do we really want to be like Jesus? And I know I've heard it before. I had a friend of mine many, many, many years ago, and I said something like that. I just want to be like Jesus. And he looked at me he's like, yeah, they killed him. We sounded really bad coming from a preacher. But that's our goal. No matter how old you are, do you want to be, do you want to look to the world like Jesus? Giving the Holy Spirit full access to your life. You probably know somebody that They've been coming to church for a long time. They, they've been a follower of Jesus, so to speak, but they just haven't grown. You know, those, those are the people we like to talk about them behind their back. But instead, what if we went up to them and put our arm around them and said, hey, can we go have a cup of coffee? Can we go talk? I, 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 I want to ask something. I want to I see how you are. <laughs> how can I, and here's the selfless part, how can I, I help you because there's so much more for your life that God wants if you'll just let him. So if you're not growing, let me ask you this question. What, what's keeping you from growing? And really, the only answer we have at our, if we're really honest, is ourselves. Does it mean you've lost your salvation? No. We're Baptists. Once saved, always saved. But from there, we then begin to expand outward. You know, I think it's interesting. When Jesus says in Matthew 28, um, it's really interesting. He says, go therefore and make Okay, y'all could have given the Sunday school answer and it would have worked. <clears throat> Go therefore and make disciples. Do you know he, he said that before he said baptize them? I'll let you wrestle with that one all day then. Go make disciples. It's a guy who really is a retired pastor, retired director of missions named Joe McKeever, great guy. If you ever find him on Facebook, he's a great guy to follow. Um, he says this about Matthew 28. Please notice it was not to make members, converts, decisions, friends, admirers, voters, supporters, donors, associates, advisors, assistants, helpers, counselors, critics, groupies, pupils, customers, buddies, pals, Imitators, defenders, volunteers, temps, guests, visitors, hostess, representatives, or agents. He said, go make disciples. And when that happens, this thing called discipleship in the church goes viral. And here's the beauty in this. It's doesn't, it, it, it requires everyone, everyone can do it. It doesn't rely on just one. Every one of can you imagine? I'm not, I'm going to pretend that there's 200 people in this room. I didn't count, but we're going to pretend there's 200 in the room. If one of you, if all, if every one of you, all 200 of you, shared Jesus with one person tomorrow, how many people would this church have shared Jesus with? Okay, where are my teachers at? 200. Now you have 400. If those 400 people the next day shared Jesus with 200 people, how many you got? Don't try. Just don't even try. And at some point, it becomes exponential, and it becomes unstoppable. How many of you are old enough to remember Breck Shampoo? You remember that commercial? It started with one little tiny picture of a model right in the middle of the screen. Y'all remember that? And it says, and I told two friends, and they told two friends, and they told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. And pretty soon the whole screen is filled with little tiny pictures. 
Guys, that's the church. Or rather, that's what the church is supposed to be. Each one of us has to ask ourselves, am I being a true disciple every day? Where I've messed up, hey, where you mess up and you're not, God will forgive you. That's part of the learning process. I grew up in a day where my grandfather would let me do stuff, and if I got hurt, he'd just say, well, patch it up and go try again. It's the only way we learn. It's the same way. You mess up, ask God to forgive you, get back on the path, take up your, your figurative cross, and keep walking. Are we becoming more like our teacher? Church, we are called to make disciples, not make mere believers in Jesus. And you're like, well, we're supposed to share the gospel. That is absolutely correct. But he said, go make disciples and then baptize them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, I've given you the authority to do that. And here's why I think this works. And we talk about the, the come full circle back to the question of why, why then are they, are they not going to come back? It's because we didn't go get them. We didn't invest in them. Some still will never come back. That's not your responsibility. Our, your responsibility, my responsibility is to share Jesus and disciple them. I want to challenge you this, this year. I want you to find somebody. Guys, find a young man. Find a, a man younger than yourself. If you've got gray hair, find someone that doesn't have gray hair. Ladies, find somebody. Find a young woman. Go up to her and say, can we, can we go have coffee? Speak into their lives. That's viral discipleship. Speak. By the way, do you guys realize and know this, that when someone invites you to a cup of coffee, it is never about the coffee? Think about it. Anybody? It's never about the coffee. If I invite you to go have coffee, trust me, it is not about the coffee. I can make way better coffee at the house. It's about you. It's about time with you. They want to possibly invest in you. They want to encourage you. Yes, they may want to challenge you. But I believe when you do that, the disciples are going to want to be around disciples. They want to hang out together. It's up to us, each and every one of us, not just one of us. Over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to unpack that. And you're like, wow, it's going to take you six weeks just to unpack that. You just did it in one sermon. No, this is deep, guys. This is who we are. This is everything we're about. Sharing Jesus and making disciples. Doing whatever we have to to accomplish those two things. To reach those who have fallen away a little bit. To reach those who have never been through the doors. And I would love to see us go viral this year. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. Karina will be playing, and I'm going to pray. And If there's something God has laid in your heart, maybe you want to come down front and just pray and say, you know, God, 2022 has got to be my year to be the disciple you've called me to be. Come down here and pray. If you know somebody that's, that's made that commitment, come down and pray with them. Maybe you want to join Salem. Come down. This is a time, this is that response time to come down and to join what this church is still making history after 220 years. You want to be a part of it. It might be worth the drive, guys. I don't know. Um, or maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe in 2021, all the stuff you had counted on is gone. The stuff you put your faith in, gone. Dissipated. Failed you. Here is a Jesus that wants to say, it's okay. I forgive you. Now come follow me. Come follow me. Confess your sins. Believe that he is the son of God. That he was raised from the dead. And he said, come follow me. I'm going to ask if you would to stand. We're going to sing.
And as we close, if there's something that God has laid on your heart, I want to encourage you to come. Would you bow with me? Father God, thank you. I know growing up, God, I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't the best student. <laughs> I'm so thankful that as your student, when I don't pass the test, when I don't pass the quiz, when I am given challenges or opportunities, when I fail, you forgive. God, I love that you said, you, you called everyone around you. Everyone. Because they needed to hear it. They needed the chance to make a decision, to make that choice. If you're here today, whatever choice you need to make, don't be ashamed. Make it public. Make it real. I'll be down here at the front if you will come as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me? Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. Before you head out, I want to remind you, Shannon has a, a parents meeting immediately following the service. Please sign up uh, for the reception or the party for uh, Kevin and Brenda uh, for next week. Please go online and sign up that. You can do that from the website. Celebrate, make big celebration. Uh, the average lifespan of a Baptist pastor is less than three years. Uh, so 33 is miraculous. Uh, and so you guys should celebrate that. Before you go, one more thing. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have a great day.